tonight we're going to start a new series in the book of Ruth. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open that up. Those notes that you have in front of you, I want to encourage you to do something with those. I um, want, want you to take those home. You could... Um, just uh, take those home with you because on, on one side there's notes from the night, but on the other side there's important information that needs to go home. So if there's questions about events, if there's questions about things that, that uh, you need to know, the most important things, the most up-to-date announcements are on there for you. So take that home. That's our way of sending you home with something to give to your folks because here's the reality. I can say something up here. Joe can say something. Griffin can say something. Any number of leaders can get up here and tell you something, and then you're going to forget it as soon as you walk out the door, right? Am I, am I right? I do it. I leave meetings, and I'm like, yeah, what'd they say? Um, I know I'm supposed to remember something. Write it down. Put it, uh, take it with you. If there's something to be communicated, you need to know that. All right, so I got to be, I need to be completely honest with you. Uh, the book of Ruth is one of those books that I've always been uh, timid to teach through, and here's why. It's got a girl's name on it. No offense, but it's like, I know it's in the Hall of Ladies, but um, not for that reason, but the content inside the book of Ruth is encouraging and, and inspiring, but there are things in there that you're like, why the book of Ruth? Why is it in the Bible? What is so important about this, this book in the Bible that, that God would see to it to put it inside the Bible as a whole, and then why would we teach through it right now? We're almost at summer. But inside the book of Ruth, there's this powerful story of someone who has just hit rock bottom. And she's had several things happen in her life. So we're going to start tonight by reading from the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 1. Verses 16 through 18. So if you would stand with me to honor the reading of the word. We're going to do this um, FBK fashion. There we go. There's a few dollars. All right. So we're in the, this is towards the end of the, the kickoff to this story. Of what's happening with Ruth. But listen to what happens. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God, where, I, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So let's, let's pray as we begin our time in the book of Ruth. God, we thank you so much, again, for this day that you've given to us. And I thank you for the students and the leaders that are here. But Father, more importantly, we want to say thank you. For Jesus, who perfectly loved us, gave us everything that we need, and you have provided to us the words for living. Everything that we need for life and practice and, and living with you is found in, in the pages of this book called the Bible. We believe it is your word. We believe it is profitable for teaching and for training. And God, you teach and you train in the way that only you do, and sometimes we don't understand it. So Father, I pray tonight that we would see from the book of Ruth as we begin this series all that you have to show us. Thank you so much for your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Ryan. Amen. As you have a seat, um, we start the book of Ruth. Now, it's, it's kind of out of sync with everything else we have done. We did a series in the book of Judges. Do you remember that? The series is called Called to Duty, and we used the little graphics up there, and we talked about the different judges that popped up in the book, and this book falls after the book of Judges, and before 1st and 2nd Samuel. We did that, we positioned it in a certain way because of the way it falls in history, but look at what happens in the very beginning of the book of Ruth. It starts this way, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Now... Um, this is like setting up the worst case scenario, okay? There's a famine, there's nothing to eat, right? There's also a lot of confusion about who's, how we're going to be sustained. Um, I, I'm one of those guys, anybody ever watch uh, shows that depict a post-apocalyptic world? Like, yet yeah, Griffin, what is the show? Uh, Revolution. Revolution was a good one, right? All the power goes out, the power grid collapses, 
And, they, and these little warring factions pop up. I thought that was interesting. John? The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead, okay, there's one. Um, the one is a little more uh, fictitious and interesting. The one where the power grid collapses, maybe a little more realistic. What you got? Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time. I had never seen that one. I'm going to have to check that one out. All right, so listen to this. Listen to this. Can you imagine for a moment everything that you rely on you depend on is taken from you. And that's the season you're living in. Grocery stores are empty. Your pantry's empty. Like there's nothing in the fridge. <laughs> you can't just walk up and go, where's the snacks? Because there's no snacks. That would be rough, right? You eat maybe one meal a day. And a famine in the land is really, there's nothing to harvest meaning that the, the crops are not yielding what they're used to. If you drive up here, depending on what year you come, you'll see soybeans or you'll see corn growing on the property. We have a farmer who farms our property, and you'll see these two different things. But imagine, if you will, nothing is being farmed. There's, there's, it's just barren, and it's, there's no food. And you would probably go to desperate lengths to feed yourself, right? You, you'd find a food source somewhere or you would move and that's exactly where we find ourselves in this story. And a man of Bethlehem, continuing verse one, and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So he said, there's nothing here to eat. We're gonna starve. I'm gonna find a new place to go. And he goes there and look at what happens. The name of the man was Elimelech. That's a fun one to say 10 times fast. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Recognize that name? Bethlehem? Hold on to that. All right. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Now, there's the sad part of the stories coming. But they stay for a season. They stay to try to wait out the famine, and they're growing. Their family begins to flourish. And the sons, they do something. They go into the country of Moab. But something happens in verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. All right, so bad thing one, there's a famine. I've got to leave town. Bad thing two, after we've left town and we begin to have sustenance, my husband dies. Now, the name of the husband is very interesting. The name of the husband means my God is king. Or God the king if you look at some translations of the Hebrew. And the powerful thing about that is this man knew that God had done something, caused the famine. This is, this is the way things work. They looked to God to be their provider. And he said, listen, God is not providing here, but I have a responsibility to provide for my family. I'm going to leave and I'm going to travel and I'm going to show them where to find food. And as he does that, he dies. So tragedy one, have nothing to eat, is desperate, we move. Tragedy two, husband dies. Now, these two sons took Moabite, Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. Hence the name of the book. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died. Okay, hold up. Wait a minute. Famine, husband dies, two sons die, and leave three women, one of which is the mother-in-law. Now, I've been married for a while, okay? And I'm just saying, that can get tense. Not from personal experience, so I've heard, okay? Edit that part out, Joe. I will get in trouble. <clears throat> but think about this for a second. Here's this lady, Naomi, left home. Her husband dies. Her sons marry other women. And what happens in a marriage relationship, this is the interesting thing. When people get married, they don't typically stay with mom and dad. <laughs> they move away. And they're married. They begin a new life. But these two stayed with mom and dad. And dad dies, and now mom, he, they're with mom, and they're providing for and caring for mom. And that happens today. Right, you'll see a, a, a younger married couple whose parents are aging, and eventually mom and dad will move close to them to provide for their care and all that kind of stuff. But in this case, both the sons die. Her dependents die, and now they're left. She's left with her two daughters-in-law that are not her, kid, not her kids. They're, they're in-laws. And with in-laws, 
she doesn't really know them well, and they don't know her well. They've only been married. They've only lived together 10 years. 10 years is not a long time, guys. It's a short amount of time to get to know somebody, but you can learn a lot about somebody in about 10 minutes. <laughs> but can you imagine living life with people that you don't know in a desperate situation and all of your family's gone and now you've got to figure out what am I going to do for myself? And look at what happens. We transition to another passage of Scripture, but here's, here's something that I've noticed in my life. Have you ever had a senseless thing happen sometimes? Um, things in our life just don't make sense. Remember that, that moment? Like, you don't really, it doesn't make any sense. Sometimes our experiences in life won't make sense. Can you imagine how Naomi felt? Like, what are you doing? First, you almost starved me to death, and now you've left me husbandless and sonless. I've got nobody but these two crazy in-laws that I don't know. It doesn't make any... God, what are you doing? You ever had that moment? Did you notice it's, it's a loss in loyalty is the title of the message tonight? She loses everything, but who's been loyal to her the whole time? God has been loyal to her the whole time. He is faithfully providing for her. But there are moments in our lives, and sometimes it happens, and especially in my life, I look back and I go, God, what did I do? I want to blame God for all of the, the pain and all of the hurt. And yes, this was part of God's plan for her. He's driving her to a place. Remember that, that word, Bethlehem? You know what that means in Hebrew? It means house of bread. Guess who came from the house of bread? What's his name? Sunday school answer. Jesus. <laughs> you can whisper his name if you want. There's power there too. That's a funny, funny joke from a small group. Anyway, <laughs> Jesus, the bread of life, would be born later in the house of bread. And where does Naomi turn her gaze? I'm going home in just a second. But she's trying to make sense of what's happening. And as if nothing could get worse, it does. Everybody is gone. And she has these crazy two people to get to know, to love on. And look at what happens later in the story. In spite of this condition, her faith keeps her strong. She's going back to where she knows is safe. Look what happens. Then she rose, verse 6, with her daughters-in-law, two of them, remember, daughters-in-law, to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. There's her faith is restored. I'm go, I can be provided for. I'm going to go home. But here's the problem. She's going to be an outcast. She and her daughters-in-law are going to be outcasts if they go back to Judah. Her husband's dead. Her sons are dead. People looked at people back then if those circumstances surrounded them. Everyone looked at them and said, what'd you do? You must have done something wrong. God is punishing you. And she is faced with returning. Now she's got a dilemma. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. So she's telling her daughters-in-law, You don't have to stay with me. Leave. Go home. Go home home. Not just with me, but go home. To where you grew up. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She's saying, thank you. You are a blessing to me. I pray that God is a blessing to you. Go and be on your way. Love you. Mean it. Right? Get out of here. Now, verse 9. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Now she's asking God to grant them to have another husband. Now, there's got to be immense heartbreak here. Crazy, senseless time. And she sends them out, hope you find a husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Now, when it says lifted up their voices, it's not like crying. It's not like, not like singing like we've done. It's more like wailing. Have you ever heard somebody scream out loud, like so heartbroken they can't control it? Have you ever seen that? Like body is shaking, I can't control how loud I am. I've watched uh, children get so upset, like little toddlers, they can't control it, and then they get, they get sick from being so upset. Like, that's the kind this is talking about. Out loud, visibly, uh, audibly telling the world, my heart is broken. I'm leaving behind what I've known for 10 years. 
And they said to her, verse 10, No, we will return with you to your people. We are going to walk with you down this road because it's not going to be easy. And she says this, But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? She's like, what? Why? This doesn't make any sense. You have your whole life in front of you. And this senseless thing has happened. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to set you free. Go and be free. And they said to her, what they say? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, why would you, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughter, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. There it is. There it is. My life is terrible. I don't want to welcome you into my terribleness. Go. Because God has been mean to me. He's been hurtful. It doesn't make sense. It's not fair. You ever said those words? It's okay, safe place. It's not fair. It doesn't make any sense, right? Why? Why? This is not fun. I don't want to welcome you into my unfunness. But here's the truth. Senseless experiences have a purpose. This has a purpose. What seems senseless, what seems crazy, that a husband and sons die, and now she's stuck with these daughters-in-law. Naomi's got... People that love her. And watch what happens. Verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. Okay, ladies, I'm not trying to be mean, but one cry is enough. The guys didn't laugh. <laughs> All right. Guys in the room, women cry more than just once about the same thing. Some of them cry more than that, more than twice, sometimes a bunch. All right, depending on the circumstance. They wept again. <laughs> and Orpah kissed her mother's in law her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now, here's the parting moment. This senseless experience that just happened. Mother-in-law said, go your way. The daughters-in-law said, I'm staying with you because I love you and I want to take care of you. And she said, why? Because you're not going to get, I'm not getting married again to have sons. And in that day, here's the interesting thing. In that day, the brother of the bride or the groom who died had the responsibility, if he was not married, to marry the widow of his brother, okay? That's a very interesting Jewish culture custom. Griffin shaking his head, nope, mm -mm, nope. Now think about it for a second. Your brother gets married, brother dies, and you're the other dude in the family, you're supposed to marry the bride regardless. It's like a law. You didn't have a choice, okay? Now, she's not having any more kids. Even if she gets married, she said, there's no hope for you. There's no one to redeem you. Do you know what it means to be redeemed? Anybody have any money? Got cash on them? Like a five or a ten? I don't carry cash, or I'd, I'd use it. Sure. Oh, man, we broke up in here. <laughs> All right, you got a couple bucks? All right, you're going to need that back. All right. All right, so I have a couple dollars. It's, it's good enough for like... I don't know, a couple of Dollar Tree, Dollar Tree. So two Ash Browns or like an ice cream cone at McDonald's or something, right? All right, so I have $2 in my hand. Um, I'm, I'm looking for something that I want in here. Uh, yeah, will you take $2 for your phone? You will, for real? Seriously? Oh, okay. Um, would you take $2 for your hat? No? All right. Uh, what's your glasses? Would you take $2 for your glasses? <laughs> Yeah, would you take you, would you take two dollars for? Would you honestly take two dollars? No, you wouldn't. All right, uh, let's see. Would you take two dollars for your jacket? No. You have a coke for two bucks. Is it is it full or is it half empty? No, it's gone. It's just ice. Is it really? I'll give you I'll give you a dollar. Really? No, you got to give the dollar. Oh, it's not that good. Why would you tell me that? I don't know. All right. Joe, would you give me your Bible for two dollars? <laughs> no way. No. <laughs> All right. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Two dollars. In our mind, we look at two dollars and we say it's not worth a whole lot, right? In the grand scheme of eternity, our lives before Christ are worth less than this. 
You know why? <laughs> because of our sin. But God says they're priceless. I will pay anything to redeem you. Because here's what happens. When I give you money and I buy something, I am redeeming this money for that thing. And God said, for your life, I'm going to give my sons. And in Naomi's life, the only thing that was going to redeem her daughters-in-law was for her to have more sons. No more sons available. Loss and loyalty. These ladies had to decide, what are we going to do? Because to the world, we're tainted, we're broken. But God is going to do something really cool in this story. Even though the senseless act of them dying, it doesn't make sense in the world, it makes perfect sense to what God is going to do. There is a purpose in those sen what we think are senseless things. Now, two bucks. Daryl, will you take two bucks for a hug? Yeah, buddy. All right. <laughs> we, we like hugs. Yeah. yeah. All right. There we go. That was a good name for free. No, no. You good? No, I'm good. <laughs> if you cut me, it's going to be a problem. All right. <laughs> Listen to this. Some of y'all caught that. Um, in the midst of all of this craziness, all of this senseless act, God is, God is doing something to show I'm going to make this right, but you have to be patient. Watch what happens. Look at verse 19. Well, actually, we'll read verse, verse 15 and following. Verse 15, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. In, in Moab, they had foreign gods. They weren't the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a plethora of gods, and they believed that they could worship there. Now, something happened. See, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and went on her way. There was this parting of the family. But Ruth stays with Naomi. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Here's loyalty. Listen. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Ruth, in her mind, is convinced that something better awaits her with her mother-in-law than awaits her if she leaves and goes home. And she's going to the very place where salvation is going to come from generations later. She is convinced something has worked in her heart to say, God, you're going to do something. I don't know what it is, and I don't even know what to call you. But I'm trusting that this is where I need to be. You ever had that moment? Like, it doesn't make any sense, but I know i got to do this. I know I have to text that person or make that phone call or have that conversation. I have, to have, I have to do it. She knows she has to do it. So in verse 19, watch this. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. It doesn't say that the conversation stopped. Can you imagine for a second? It's, they're going up. It's like 300 feet above sea level. It's one of the highest places. They're going up to this city from where they were in Moab, and there's a long journey. They're walking. It's not like walking from your house here. It's like walking from your house to Columbus, okay? It's going to take a while. It's going to take several days, more than likely, to walk. And they're having conversations. And on the way, here they go. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. Now think about this. It's Naomi. She was married. What does it say, she says? The, woman in, the women in, in town said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. Listen to her heart. She's seen loyalty from her daughter-in-law. And listen to what her heart says. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Loyalty displayed in the, in the heart of her daughter-in-law is still not working through the mother-in-law. She's having a hard time seeing God's goodness in all of this. But they go home. She knew she was going to be fed when she went back. She's going to get the physical sustenance that she needs to keep living. But life is coming, and it's awesome. So here's, here's the transition that I wanted to illustrate to you. She calls, she has two names, Naomi and Mara. Naomi means pleasant, but Mara means bitter. Here's what I want you to see. Naomi's struggling to see it. Ruth's got some faith planted in her heart somewhere. 
But here's what I hope all of us hear. Regardless of how senseless things seem, there's a purpose. And the tests that we go through are meant to strengthen us. Why do you think God provided such a person like Naomi for Ruth to travel with? You ever thought about that? In the moment, it seems crazy. They all die. But God provided Naomi with Ruth and Ruth with Naomi. This awesome relationship to carry them through to see that their life was going to be restored. That test that they are walking through, that long walk and all of those conversations are leading somewhere and it's going to do something powerful in Ruth's life and Naomi's life, actually, when we read the rest of this book together. But here's what verse 22 says. So Naomi returned and Ruth, the Moabite daughter-in-law with her, to Bethlehem, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now you notice that's highlighted in yellow. We started with famine. We began with harvest season. We started with death and despair. We're beginning with redemption and life. It's coming. And the stage is set in these two ladies' lives to realize all that God has been doing in their life and he's going to bring some awesome things to fruition in their life. And I don't know where you're at in here. I don't know if, if you've got uh, difficult seasons, difficult things going on in relationships, things are just not right at home. Maybe there's, maybe it just seems like nothing's working. Nothing makes sense. Let me promise you, cast your gaze. When you cast your gaze on Jesus, all of those things, they make perfect sense after you walk through them. Sometimes it doesn't make sense when you're in the middle of it. But when you get to the end, you'll look back and go, Huh, that's what you were doing. But you can't, you can't quit. See what they did? Verse 22, read it. So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite daughter-in-law, her daughter-in-law with her. Even when they came back to town, the ladies, the whole town was stirred up. They had every reason to quit, every reason to turn out of the gate and leave and go back to where they came from because they were tainted, they were stained. There was nothing for them. But they stayed with it, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, they return, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Now something's going to happen next week. I want to set the table for it. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Remember how I talked about redemption? Redeeming, restoring, purchasing, covering. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's. A worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. His name was Boaz. Did you see where he came from? Elimelech, whose name meant, my God is king. We promise you in here, God is still on his throne. He is working his purposes out in your life, even though they don't make sense all the time. Cool? Cool. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the beginning of the book of Ruth. And I thank you um, that you are setting the table for one of the most beautiful redemption stories, in my opinion. <clears throat> the story that you're telling in each of our lives, you paid for us as you sent your son to die in our place for our sins. And you purchased and redeemed us. And that redemption is ours through your grace by faith in Christ. Father, I pray that we would see the reality of what you have done for us as we look in Naomi's life and Ruth's life and see what you are doing for them. You are king. Our God is king. As we look at loss and loyalty, Father, help us to see that although it seems like we're, we may lose a lot of things here, you are always loyal. Father, we thank you again for this time in your word. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' good name. Amen.